Padawan, where is the Force? Everywhere. It is within me. It surrounds me. Just so. It connects you. There will be times when emotion, pain, or exhaustion... Just wait till these isolated... I carried so much hate. ...feel cut off. There's nothing quite like Star Wars. Other works of science fiction have crafted compelling worlds and narratives, but none have scratched the itch that John Williams' theme playing over the infamous opening crawl does in a matter of seconds. There's just nothing quite like it. Star Wars is a polymorphic franchise in that it can be as simple as you want it to be and as complex as you want it to be. Whether you are a casual fan who enjoys your time on the surface level of what Star Wars is, or you are a mega fan with the galactic map on your wall and a notebook full of decoded Star Wars languages at your bedside, there's something here for you. But with such a wide spectrum of knowledge and lore, what would we call Star Wars? What's its definition? Franchise is a word, but even that feels dull and limited, unable to fully encapsulate and express all that Star Wars is. If someone were to ask you, out of honest curiosity, having never heard of it, what Star Wars is, what would you tell them? Star Wars is a movie, a trilogy of movies, multiple trilogies of movies, a game series, a book series, a comic series, a toy line, a clothing line, a merchandise monster, a media empire. What is Star Wars? The way I approach this question is by posing another. What is Star Wars trying to say? For as long as I've been able to truly appreciate the artistry of what were once very simple things to me, movies, games, and books, I've pondered at the foundational elements of those things. This inquiry led me down a path of research and serious thought, and eventually I asked the most important question of all, what are the pillars of story? When dug down into its anatomical structure, story begins with premise. The premise is a very simple statement of what the story is about, not just the main character, the setting, and the progression of the plot, but what the philosophical message of the plot is, what the story is trying to say. Take The Hunger Games, for instance. A young girl volunteers to take her little sister's place in a tournament that pits teenagers against each other in a fight to the death, testing her resolve and endurance, leading her to discovering what it truly means to be human, and eventually transforming her into the leader of an uprising. Simple. The philosophy is clearly displayed, and the progression of the main character is thought out. The technical terms of Pan Am, the districts, character names, and all of that are left out so as to highlight what really matters what the story is trying to say. So what would be the premise of Star Wars? The prequel and original trilogies both tell a complete story from beginning to end, but anthology films, games, comics, and TV shows go in different directions. Some directly connect to the main plot of those two trilogies, while others are more divorced from it. Movies like Rogue One and Solo catalog events leading up to the original trilogy while shows like The Clone Wars and Rebels give us valuable and at times crucial context in which to place the events of both trilogies. In that regard, what is Star Wars about? What is Star Wars trying to say? No. Go, my son. Leave me. No, you're coming with me. I'll not leave you here, I've got to save you. You already have, Luke. You were right. You were right about me. Tell your sister. You were right. After replaying Jedi Fallen Order in preparation for its coming sequel, I can only come to one conclusion about its premise. 
A young man flees from a dangerous purge that sought his destruction to hide out in gilded comfort, only to awaken to a most deadly enemy in the eleventh hour of his peace. Challenged by his traumas and grief, held in place for too long by a tyrannical empire that only ever benefited from his inaction, faced with certain doom and the venom of temptation, he must reclaim what was lost, reforge what was broken, and remember who he is. Not too dissimilar from the story of Luke or the story of Anakin. To me, Star Wars says that there is purpose in failure, hope in redemption, more strength in love than in power, and a light inside us all, beyond however many layers of darkness. And if we could only grab hold of that light and seek it in others, we can reclaim what was lost. Jedi Fallen Order doesn't just tell us of these themes, it demonstrates them. Through its captivating story, immersive worlds, heartfelt performances, and engaging, yet frustrating, gameplay, we learn the lessons Cal must learn. Each step along this path as Cal only ever brings our own fractured patience and rippled emotions into the spotlight. We are aligned with his journey as we too start as a beginner fail over and over again, and eventually become a force to be reckoned with. So what is Star Wars? If I had to use one word to describe what Star Wars is, I'd say it's a universe. That from a simple 1970s movie, from a studio that took a risk on a young filmmaker with a dream and a passion for storytelling, has through the artistry and creativity of so many wonderful people become a universe full of stories, characters, and interconnected plots infused with wisdom beyond the world of fantasy. I mean, how many times has someone said, do or do not, there is no try to you in real life? No? Just me. Well, alright then. What lays at the foundation of this universe of stories is a philosophy that tells the real story, providing a lens through which we see and experience these worlds. So let's take a look at that foundation. This is the philosophy of Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order. We open on Bracca, a graveyard of the Clone Wars. It is not where the cause of the Republic is honored or where the lives that were lost are memorialized. The past isn't enshrined here, it's desecrated. The rumbled remains of battles long past somehow find a way into even finer fragments. There are scraps used to fuel the Imperial War machine that now holds the galaxy on its knees. The history that's buried beneath stone and metal once served as a warning sign of all that has come after its time, but now it's far too late to read the signs. Cal Kestis has hidden from the ever-wandering eye of the Empire as a Bracca scrapper. With deep-seated trauma from his days as a Jedi Padawan and the purge of Order 66 that took his master's life and very nearly took his. After years of laying low, his hand is forced to reveal what is now considered a mystical power of a bygone era to save a friend. Jedi hunters known as Inquisitors come for his head, and what was perhaps inevitable is made flesh. Yes, you are. No! Look at this, a lightsaber. I found the Jedi! In her introduction, the second sister is a faceless, mechanically cold warrior, wielding the same type of weapon as the Jedi, only not in the colors of his master or others he had trained and fought alongside. This blade seemed stained with blood containing still the cries of its victims, like it had vacuumed them from their fatal wounds. And if she has anything to say about it, Cal will be the next soul, crushed under its weight. As fast as a lightsaber ignites, Cal's life changes completely. The chase above sickening heights on a train of lightning speed is an illustration of what Cal has been doing all along. Running. Running from his past, his fears, his trauma, his destiny. 
He learned to run very early on. At the time Order 66 came down, all he could do is run. The crumbling blocks of the train symbolize how Cal's life has fallen apart and how it continues to be torn, blasted, and broken by the one true power in the galaxy. A shadow he cannot escape, no matter how far or how fast he runs. The Empire. Even once he's safe aboard the Mantis, he will never truly be safe again. But Seer offers him a chance to no longer be afraid, to no longer have to run. A chance to rebuild what was broken, to reforge the Jedi Order. She trusts him enough to reveal that she was once a Jedi, though her reasons for no longer being one remain hidden for now, buried beneath fear, doubt, and trauma. He and Seer share a lost ability to trust oneself, even with all the voices calling out to you, being still and listening to the voice inside of you. Failure is not the end, my friend. I believe in you, as I always have. From the time we step foot on Bogano, we are engulfed in a serene but foreign environment that is just begging to be explored. The first creatures we come across aren't hostile, don't get used to it. They only admire our presence as we do theirs. Even you sadists can't hurt them if you want to. And we all know you want to, you disgusting fucks. There is so much to explore, yet our path is initially straightforward because we lack the ability to traverse much of the terrain set before us. Cal has lost much of his connection to the Force. In flashbacks initiated by environmental cues, we see Cal's training as a Jedi Padawan. Through these, we get a bigger picture of Cal's journey, giving us insight into how he was trained, the philosophies he was taught to embrace. One such philosophy is quoted verbatim from the great philosopher and notable emperor of the Roman Empire, Marcus Aurelius. What stands in the way becomes the way. Marcus Aurelius is one of the most well-known Stoic philosophers, and to be Stoic, in one sense, is to be still calm, untouched by the chaos that surrounds, detaching from one's expectations and personal attachments to things you cannot control. More so than any other school of philosophy, I think Stoicism is the most prevalent to the Jedi, as they try to be unaffected by the winds of change, yet ever connected to the essence, to the energy flowing around them. That's what every Jedi trains themselves to be, connected yet separate. Connected to the greater good, yet in many ways separated from the means by which that greater good is produced, preserved, or provided. Blind to what may be destroyed by its prevail, withdrawn from the emotion that threatens its resolve. They desire peace, yet they live by the sword. The lightsaber is immensely significant to the story of Star Wars. It's a weapon of brute force, yet it's also a beacon of light to shine out into the darkness. The balance of defense and offense justice and mercy, passion and strength. Shining outward is both a warning to the wicked and a message to the masses, with even the mere sight of it, the sound of its hum, echoing like a deep rhythm of the universe. The lightsaber is an icon of the wrath of the greater good, and of its promise, that there will always be hope for those who fight, those who rise up and defend peace, for peace is something that will always need safeguarded. It's a delicate thing. But the lightsaber can also be manipulated and corrupted to mean something completely different. The Sith use it as an iron fist, a weapon of power wielded over the weak, which creates a duality of light and dark, a blue or green blade, and sometimes purple, crossed with a red one. The collision of opposing philosophies lays at the root of lightsaber fights. It always has. From the fight between a fallen Jedi who gave himself to the dark side, believing that what he was doing in service of the Empire is righteous, and a young boy from a faraway world, holding tight the ideology of hope, that whatever may come and with whatever has passed, there is a reason to keep on going, to keep moving forward. There is hope. The fight between Luke and Vader is a collision of conflicting worldviews. Their first fight is between a scared boy in way over his head, staving off an evil he cannot comprehend, and a warrior toying with the idea of innocence and desperation, merely seeing what this boy who's supposed to challenge him is made of. Their second fight is between two warriors, a former Jedi and a current Jedi, only 
Luke no longer looks at Vader through the eyes of a young boy, frightened and desperate to escape with his life. He looks upon Vader through the eyes of a Jedi. His fight is for his father's soul. A plea for redemption amongst the inflamed conflict of the visible battle and the poisonous words of the Emperor searing his ears. In a sense, Luke is fighting Vader for Anakin. To rid him of this painful mask that has consumed everything he ever was, everything he ever could have been, Anakin can no longer fight the dark side alone. He isn't strong enough. So Luke comes to his aid, and together they defeat it. That's what a Jedi does. I'll not leave you here. I've got to save you. You're already at Luke. You are right. You are right about me. Being so limited initially gives us perspective. There's so much of Bogano that we'd like to travel, but we can't. We're unable. We're weak. And just in case the environment doesn't make it clear that we are only a learner, Ogdo Bogdo shows us how truly ill-equipped we are. This first boss humbles us and lets us know just how much we have yet to learn, beaten into our heads after we get b slapped over and over by a giant frog. Even so, we find BD-1 who leads us to the temple where we are granted access to the messages of Jedi Master Eno Cordova. He speaks of a holocron with the name of Force-sensitive children from across the galaxy. Hope for the Jedi. Hope for Cal. Hope for Seer. A possible redemption arc for the Fallen Order. But it will come at a price. From here, we can either go to Zepho or Dathomir, like a naive little Bambi prancing on up to get a drink, unaware of the decimation that is about to take place. I chose to go to Dathomir on my first playthrough, and holy sh**, I got my rectum inverted and then replaced with the stuff they used to make gummy bears. It was awful. It made me question my entire existence. I even now have haunting flashbacks. Some could say it was my Vietnam. <laughs> But you can leave Dathomir and go to Zepho instead, which is a much easier time. Oh, couple bumps ain't gonna kill you, kid. <laughs> Unless the wind picks up. Can you tell that bucket of balls to keep his opinion to himself? I'm sure everything's under control. Because it's under control, it's just a little tricky. Though we encounter many deadly enemies and the Empire, the Zepho tomb introduces puzzles that become a staple of the gameplay, frustratingly so. They become increasingly more complex as the game progresses. Both Zepho tombs have the atmosphere of deep, ancient wisdom and secrets that have been buried for a long, long time. The first tomb leads us to Kashyyyk, where a war rages on from the days of the Clone Wars. A planet under siege, a group of rebels stand against the consuming machine of the Empire as it destroys Kashyyyk piece by piece. The beauty of this world is being lost day by day, melting under the Imperial arm. The Shio bird gives us a different perspective as Cal notes, there's so much that the Empire hasn't touched. There is still so much beauty and we can do our part to preserve what is left of it. A notion that is immediately challenged when the ginormous Ninth Sister comes a knocking. Defeating her is such a challenge to where many will decide not to continue the game because they will get so frustrated when they'll probably come back to it, agonizingly so. Her fall marks a threshold for Cal. He killed an Inquisitor. Instead of running, he faced his opponent head-on and overcame her. It's just another step closer to the Jedi he can become. The time then comes to return to Dathomir, or for some of you, to go there for the first time. It's a hollow place, full of so much darkness and anger. Everything from the venomous spiders to the territorial Nidax wants a fight to the death. As you move through the arid landscape set before you, the eerie music and atmosphere is ever present as a gnawing tingle up your spine, never letting you forget where you are, the danger that lurks in the shadows. 
Sister Marin, the last of her kind, seeks revenge on the Jedi for the death of her people, as she has been fed a lie that the Jedi were responsible. But if you've ever seen the Star Wars animated series, you probably know that it was actually General Grievous who descended upon Dathomir and committed genocide against the Knight Sisters. That truth has been twisted by a twisted fallen Jedi, Terran Malakos, who promises great power and dominion over the Knight Brothers. But he's just another obstacle to overcome, though they'll have to wait because, you know, zombies. Foolish girl! This power is beyond your control! You both shall learn. When you face one Knight Sister of Dothamir, you face us all! Cal's flashes of memory are mixed with psychological manifestations of the pain he has endured, the loss he has experienced, and the agony he still carries with him. The guilt he feels about what happened to his master, a part of his past that shadows his present, like Grease with his gambling, which eventually comes to bite Cal in the ass. But he realizes that his past doesn't have to define his future or his present. I think his apology and his confession of this deeply affects Cal. Hey, Cal. I made a mistake. And I almost got you killed. I'm sorry. I mean, we all... Make mistakes, right? <laughs> well, maybe not you. <laughs> hey, why don't you cut her some slack? I'm not saying do it for me, but you two are the best thing that ever happened in my life. <laughs> Before you came along, all I cared about was a tight hand on a stiff eater. <laughs> That's a game turn. I know what it is. Cal, yeah, life's not a game. Before you two, all I cared about was myself. Easy money. Now it's different. But there's a trial that Cal needs to go through. Going to Ilum to build a new lightsaber is yet another threshold, a rite of passage that every Jedi must complete. The lightsaber is not just a Jedi's weapon, it's also his promise, his authority and responsibility to the path, to walk and guide that path, as every Jedi must. And so, crafting his own is his way of taking on the role and all that it entails. It's his official acceptance of his place in the grander path. This passage is also a chance for Cal to hit rock bottom as he has been beaten down by the trials he has faced, and now even the hope of the kyber crystal has failed him. Its light has faded, but with a purpose, to darken so that Cal can see the light that has been with him the whole time, the light in BD-1, and the light inside of himself. Once he sees this and accepts this, he is ready to craft a lightsaber. Combining the teachings of Jaru to Paul and the hope of Seer Junda to create the courage of Cal Kestis. Returning to Dathomir, Cal can now see Marin through the eyes of a Jedi. She is a victim of horrible circumstances, and she was lied to and manipulated. His response to her instead of, stand aside or I will strike you down, becomes compassion, which Marin isn't used to. 
She takes his olive branch and helps him defeat Malakos and then joins his crew. Cal can also see Seer and her mistakes through the eyes of a Jedi. She was also a victim. He extends compassion towards her and she then knights him as a Jedi Knight. At the Pagano Vault, Cal sees what may come to pass as a result of his mission. The younglings hunted, killed, and tortured, and him becoming an Inquisitor, falling into darkness just like Trilla. Something happens then. He sees Trilla through the eyes of a Jedi. She is also a victim of tragic circumstances. In fact, the same circumstance he found himself in as a Padawan. Only things didn't play out the same way for Trilla. If things had gone differently for him, he could be the one behind the mask. Trilla carries great pain and anger, and Cal now sees why. The weight of her trauma, of her pain, of her anger and hate is too much for him to bear. He, in a way, steps into her shoes for a moment, feels just for a second what it's like to be her. Through the unraveling of the Inquisitor Fortress, Seer can at last confront her mistakes, the cost that was Trilla's to bear, but her fate is tied. There's nothing that can be done for Trilla anymore. But Cal and Seer can still go on. They can still avenge Trilla by rebuilding the Jedi Order. But through his premonitions about the younglings on the Holocron, he sees that they can be saved from this chaos, this life of pain, that by extracting their names and going to them to recruit them as Jedi. He and Seer are damning them to a life of fear, to suffering, to the Empire's spear. So Cal decides that they should trust their fates to the Force. By the right of the Council, by the will of the Force, Cal Kestis. Rise, Jedi Knight. You are ready. What intrigues me about this game is the way it makes you live the message. You, you can play this game on an easy difficulty. But for those of us who played on a harder one, this game is not easy. It's, it's frustrating. You have to constantly keep yourself in check when you keep getting your ass kicked, keep losing to the same boss. The very philosophy that Cal uses to overcome his obstacles is the very same one you use to overcome yours. Every enemy that strikes you down, every failed parry, Every misstep sends you spiraling into anger and frustration, but you have to calm yourself and become like a stoic Jedi, not allowing your emotions to block your success. You have to learn, painstakingly learn, how to defeat your enemies. Every time you slip up, you know, you, you want to blame the mechanics or the controller or the developers for creating such a monstrosity, but in the end, it comes down to you. You have to learn from your mistakes. You have to not let your past define you, the past times you've failed. You have to realize that you can overcome, but not with anger, not with spite, or throwing your controller against the wall. You can only overcome by embracing the challenge and rising to it. You have to humble yourself and learn. Be willing to admit your mistakes and that you don't understand. That you know good and well that you did not learn the patterns of the enemy like you should have. That you didn't take the time. You only wanted to rush through it and achieve victory however quickly the satisfaction could come. And that was the problem. That is the obstacle. That is what stands in the way. And what stands in the way becomes the way. What I'm about to say is going to be super cheesy. Just all the cheese you can possibly imagine. Globs and globs of cheese. Fallen Order doesn't just bring a message of hope and overcoming your fears and traumas. It delivers those things to you by making you fight for it. You have to feel the pain of loss as you spent so much time fighting a boss only for it to start all over at the simplest mistake. The price you pay for not paying attention or not learning how to counter your opponent and watch for their signature moves. And so 
you have to adopt the very same philosophy the game portrays. It's only in confronting your own doubts and missteps that you can truly overcome the bosses and giant frogs and venomous spiders and giant bats. Well, I guess there was only one giant bat, but you know, you know what I mean. The beauty of this game is in the mess, the chaos, the undoing and the rebuilding, the learning and adapting, the trial and error, and the eventual rise to the summit, to where you can truly call yourself, with all the cheese a mouse can eat, a Jedi.